Hello everyone, welcome back, let's kill some Dermaptorans. Now, I'm very curious as to how this goes, because besides the points I made at the end of the previous episode talking about the proclivity of Dermaptorans to spawn multiple heroes, the Dermaptoran Queen was famous back in the day, she's even more so famous now, but even back in the day when people were tankier, or tanking, face tanking was generally easier, due to the way numbers worked. Even back then, she was famous for being quite the wake-up call boss for a lot of people, right? This is a bit less so now that just face tanking in general has gotten more difficult. I would say that you it's very difficult without specific preparation to face tank Warden Krieg. You can still do it, obviously, but you actually need to prepare. I did not prepare at all before face tanking Warden Krieg with this mod. And again, that's due to the old damage numbers, but even with the old damage numbers, it'll be interesting to see if the Dramaptoran Queen is as infamous under the mod rules as she was back in the day. Because that's a whole separate conversation. So I'm I'm very interested to see how this this goes down. However, I am out of energy once again, which did not take me long, but I'm not also that surprised. I really need better energy regeneration, to be honest. I didn't even put this on. There we go. There we go. Go ahead and absorb some energy from these guys with my soul blast or whatever it's called. Might as well blast the last egg there. There we go. Alright. So far, so good. Hello. I don't know why I bothered with that, to be honest. I didn't need to. I just come up here to check out this building. I believe this is the one with What's Her Face's journal in it, isn't it? Yeah. Dale's Diary, that's it. Alright, soon we're going to level up, which is going to be hugely important, because I'm going to be putting points into the Mastery Bar for Necromancer after finishing up the last of... What is this called again? Zolhan's Technique, that's it. And that's going to hopefully give me better energy regeneration, because Necromancer gives you a decent amount of spirit attribute points. Alright, finish this, and then put the rest in very specifically, yeah, Necromancer. Yeah, I get a nice amount of spirit, what is that, four per? Yeah. It's gonna give me better energy regeneration. I'm trying to get here. I think what I'm going to wind up doing, at least as a baseline idea, is go for physical internal trauma damage, splashing in Aether and vitality as I can, because I do get the boosted physical and internal trauma damage here. And then I can get more out of Ulrin's Rage. Now, I'm so concerned about damage, because I don't have, like I said before, the ability to reduce resistances. So I have to instead now deal as much damage as possible. So I think I'm going to look to that very specifically. Unless I find some item that just really either reduces... Aether and, vit and or Vitality resistances, or I just get a weapon that deals so much more Vitality and Aether resistance, I'm sorry, Aether or Vitality damage, or possibly something that converts a soldier skill into such, then we might be talking a different story. But my baseline idea here, I've decided, is to go for the physical internal trauma, because right now, because of decorated soldier as a passive skill, that's going to likely be my best avenue to deal the kinds of damage I'll be needing to do in the long term, at least as a baseline. Again, equipment in the future might change this, but that's not something I can necessarily rely on, due to the fact that obviously equipment drops are randomized, but the decorated soldier will always be there. So, I'm going to use that as sort of a default. 
um, plan of action, so to speak. So a lot of my necromancer skills that I will be picking up are going to be along the lines of passive skills or dealing in some way some form of physical damage or helping me in that aspect. I'm really not going to be going too far into the active skills of the necromancer because it's just not likely to do the kinds of damage I'll personally need. Now, obviously, I'll still want some to deal with those enemies that have high physical resistance and low either aether or vitality resistance, which is fine. But, generally speaking, I'm going to have to adapt. Which, again, brings me back to a point that I haven't finished fully forming, at least until now. What classes, well, not even classes, but what masteries are really relevant with the rules established by this mod. Again, the primary concern here is a lack of resistance reduction available to us due to the complete lack of... Hmm, um... Constellations. So, what masteries are going to be effective? Well, I mentioned some of these earlier. Obviously, Soldier is one of them. Uh, I think if you were to download this mod and play it yourself, I think you would also find the Inquisitor and the Oathkeeper to be relatively effective as well, both of which do offer resistance reduction. Now, the Inquisitor could work pretty well, I think, with Soldier, because you can change Cadence to a really nice elemental damage ability and run with that and then go for... um the Aura of Conviction, that's the one. I had a brain cramp on the name for a bit there. But the Aura of Conviction reducing elemental resistances would work really well with that. Uh, also would work really well with Arcanist, obviously. Probably as well with Demolitionist, which would also offer some nice boosts to fire and lightning damage very specifically. So if you dropped cold damage entirely, or at least as a focus, you could probably do some extremely high damage with that combination very specifically. Same thing with the Oath Keeper. And also, I think the Occultist would be a really effective mastery here. Obviously, of course, we've got Necromancer that goes without saying. But I think these would be the really big mainstay masteries that you would find effective with this mod. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find combinations to be effective that doesn't include at least one of these masteries. Again, I have Soldier here, which is a really nice boost to my physical and internal trauma damage, but without any way of reducing resistances, that's going to be mitigated, so I bust out Necromancer. But I could just have easily have gone for an Elemental Soldier build and gone with Inquisitor as well. That, or possibly a really physical and fire-focused one using Oathkeeper. I just hadn't been a Soldier Necromancer in a hot minute, and I just felt like going in that direction. And while I am going to be focusing more particularly on the physical, at least for now, as a default assumption, that doesn't mean that will stick. Alright. I, I can face tank you, I'm betting. Yeah. Easily. I'm not even busting out my strongest abilities on you. Let's let's be real here. There's men here as well. I might have to use a health potion, but I'm kind of doubting it. I'm going easy on you right now, so... I'm not... I don't even think I'm going to need the health potion. Nah, this is in the bag. All right. Slap you around a little bit here. Good. All right. Now we need to go into that cave by what's his name? Actually, I wanted to make that detour into Harpy Land so I can grab that journal out of that bat. No, it's on a corpse, isn't it? Yeah. So we'll run that and uh, fit.
figure out... Well, uh, not even... Well, we still have to find the damn hive. I hate looking for that thing. To this day, it remains one of my least favorite aspects. I'm going to throw down a rift here randomly. It remains one of my least favorite things. I mean, it's a, it's a very specific complaint. It's not like, oh, it's a flaw of the game or anything. Nah, it's just a pain in the ass. There is one thing, though, that I do want to talk about very specifically about Grim Dawn that has always confused me. It's not a complaint, but sort of a question for Iron Crate. And I'm not the first to bring this up. This has been a question for quite some time. But why are there no spears in this game? Now, this may sound like a random question, but think about, very specifically, their previous title, which was Titan Quest. If you if you didn't know, Titan Quest was made by the same people who made Grim Dawn. In fact, Titan Quest preceded Grim Dawn. But, nevertheless, despite the fact that spears exist as a primary weapon type in Titan Quest, they do not appear here. And I've never figured out why. They already had the mechanics in place for spear motion, for stats, literally everything. Again, Titan Quest plays very similarly to Grim Dawn. Grim Dawn is just, I would say, more advanced. One day I'll actually go through uh, Titan Quest, because I still love that game, and they still are putting out DLC for it every once in a while. So it's not like that game has even been abandoned or anything like that. It's still being looked at occasionally. Same thing with Grim Dawn. It's just that with Titan Quest, it's specifically being looked at in terms of DLC, which I'm fine with. I love more content for Titan Quest, but it's the question still remains, why aren't there spears in this when you already had all the groundwork laid out for spears in Titan Quest? It does not make sense to me. I mean, you could have done really cool, like, Gunlance things, just as kind of... kind of steal an idea from Monster Hunter, but you'd make them more like, uh, I don't know if any of you have played Battle Brothers, where it's a single shot, um... There's a spear you can get that's called the Flame Lance that you can arm your Battle Brothers with, and it's a single shot thing for the battle. Well, you could do something kind of like that, where there's a, a mounted thing and it has a cooldown, right? It, that would be a really great, like, epic or legendary item that you could use. And I, I don't know why this was never incorporated into the game. There's so many opportunities for cool spears you could have done. I, it just, it's never made sense to me, to be honest. That's interesting. I'm not going to equip it. I like my shield, thank you very much. But, interesting club. But yeah, I've never figured that out. And I've never heard, or or read... A good response to that either. Maybe I missed it over the years. I don't know. But I've never seen a good response as to why there aren't just spears in Grim Dawn. And this is actually one thing why I'll tell anyone who asks whether or not Grim Dawn still has potential. 100%. There's so many cool things they could continue to do with this IP. Uh, there's... You've got some great potential for some... Um, you could you could do a book series or two on this very easily. Talk about uh, Karen before or during the the um, uh, the Grim Dawn event itself, right? You could you could do um, you could help do a TV show or a book series on the formation of the the Inquisitors of the. Black Legion, um, you could explore the background more of the Ethereals, you could explore the history of them, because they apparently, you know, according to myth, legend, and rumor, they lived in Cairn before they were driven out by humanity, or someone, I can't remember the details right now, it's been a while, there's a lot here, and I know there's been, like, rumors and conversation for years about a Grim Dawn 2 or something, but they don't even need to. They have everything they technically need literally right here. Just either create DLC, you've got, a, again, potential book or TV s series going on, right? There is a lot here for a really great franchise. Now, Titan's... Quest didn't have this kind of opportunity because it was very grounded in mythology, and there's only so far you can really take that before you start to inherently contradict the mythology itself, and that idea has already been very done before. N absolutely zero offense to um, Iron Crate. 
mythology is fun. It's a great backdrop to a great adventure. And again, I love Titan Quest. Not as much as Grim Dawn, but I, I do have a soft spot in my heart for good old Titan Quest. But the, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do with that as an IEP before either it gets old or you start to just basically uh, contradict the source material itself, which of course isn't going to fly with any fan base that knows its stuff, right? But with Grim Dawn, you have a whole history here you could work with, whole areas. And I just to kind of get on to a bit of a weird topic, but this is kind of why... Disney's been struggling with Star Wars. They had so much to work with that they're barely starting to explore at this point that people, that Lucas Arts and Lucas Films had been exploring for the past couple of decades. And, well, see, Disney made a couple of mistakes when they took over the Star Wars franchise, all right? The first mistake that they made I can understand why they made it, but the first mistake they made was to declare everything except certain pieces of media non-canon. And they were... That was a very short list of things that they kept canonical. Now, I can understand why they did this, uh, since up until a few years before Disney bought it out, I would say two years before Disney bought it out, I kind of stopped following Star Wars, but I'd been a relatively substantial Star Wars fan up to two years prior, and the Star Wars canon was definitely out of control. It was it was this wild, uncontrolled beast. It was a lovely, lovely time. There was a lot of cool things in the Star Wars canon back then, but it was definitely very out of control. It was very um, off the rails, right? It was, it was starting to become uncontrollable. So I can understand why Disney killed a lot of that canonicity, right? Uh, it was a very unpopular move, and I think they went a little too heavy on cutting canonicity from pieces of media. I think they could have kept quite a bit more. They would have had more to work with today if they had. But here we are, um, with them having cut, I think, more than was healthy for the franchise. But again, the baseline motivation, I understand. And then they wanted to sort of make their mark on the franchise with a new trilogy. Again, I can I can understand this. It's actually not a bad idea. First off, George Lucas had been alluding to scripts existing for uh, 7, 8, and 9 for years, so that wasn't an entirely foreign concept that the fans themselves would necessarily be against, generally speaking, if they did it right. And I'll I've seen all three movies, and the first one, Episode 7, was good. Fairly fairly generic, I'll, I'll give it that, but it was a good opening to a potential new trilogy. I, I didn't have an issue with that, right? It was... It, it felt close enough to Episode 4 where it was definitely callback, it was definitely sort of a uh, shout-out to the fans, and it was it was a really nice sort of refresh of a similar journey, right? I also liked the perspective, although this was better explored in The Mandalorian show, I liked the perspective of the Republic not necessarily being any better at management or managing the galaxy as... The Empire was. I, I really did appreciate that. That sort of twist, right? I, I think that was a really interesting angle that I think was, at least for the main uh, Disney trilogy, I think was left largely unexplored it, properly. And then Episode Eight came out. Now, I'm going to leave aside the huge uh, Twitter fiascos here and just give my perspective of the movie, not the general public's opinion. This is, again, kind of a strange place to put this, but it, it we're talking franchises here, and I think Star Wars is one of the bigger ones to talk about and how to, how to basically goof a huge franchise with a pre-existing massive audience. But anyways, the eighth film's primary issues were... 
I want to say three primary issues. All right. Uh, one, and I think this is the most egregious, the whole thing with the the aliens being raised on the planet and the, the quest to free those, the, uh, I don't know how I would describe the aliens themselves. Um, I, I, I don't have a problem with that plot line. It just didn't belong in that movie. All right, actually, I'm going to go out on a limb and say four, four, um, four problems. Now, that was, that was the first problem. I didn't have a problem with the whole rescuing the aliens from animal cruelty plotline. I didn't have an issue with the plotline itself. My only issue was that it was included in the main trilogy. That should have been a side story. That should have been... It's fine for it to exist, but it should have been its own thing. Right? That could have been... Giving it its own thing would have given... Disney more time to better articulate not only animal cruelty, but also issues of governance, issues of crime. We could have talked about... They could have talked much more in-depth about corruption. They could have talked much more in-depth about... Um, how... Uh, government officials could be corrupted and everything like that. I think that they could have done more. It could have been a more comprehensive look at a lot of really serious real-world issues if it had been given its own thing to be its own vehicle. But putting it in the middle of a mainline Star Wars film really derails the plot. Yes, I know, in theory, it was to establish what's-his-face as a potential traitor or whatever, right? It's been a couple of years. I can't quite remember what the alleged connection there was. I, I do remember that it had something to do with sort of framing somebody, I think it was Poe, as a traitor or something like that, right? Or it was creating the idea in the background for the audience that a traitor existed, but you didn't need a whole segment of the film dedicated to rescuing the aliens for that to be set up. That was a large amount of the movie wasted on a plot line that, again, by itself is fine, but doesn't belong in the greater context. There were more serious things going on at that time in relation to the film's plot that needed the character's attention. Yes, the anim the animals. Well, yeah, I guess you could... We might as well just say it for what it is. The animals were suffering, yes. But are you going to stop and save the animals when a hostile foreign power is trying to invade your uh, your country? No, you're not going to do that. You're going to pay attention to the immediate larger threat of foreign invasion first, which is basically kind of what the, f the, f the, the First Order, that's what their group was, the First Order was doing to the Republic at that point, right? That is basically what that was. That's what you pay attention to first, right? Again, Great side story. If it had been given its own vehicle, it could have been much more fleshed out and had much more, not only the serious conversation about animal cruelty, but we could have had, additionally, on top of that, some really serious and great examinations of corruption and crime and the nature of these. Could have been way better as its own... It would have been way better as its own side plot. Even if you wanted to use... Finn and I, for the life of me, can't uh, Rose. I think the character's name was. Even if you wanted to use the same characters, that would have been fine. But put it after the mainline trilogy, right? It was it was alluded to, sort of loosely, in the Disney trilogy that the Republic wasn't necessarily great at resolving issues within the Republic, and you could have framed Finn and Rose going off and rescuing these aliens and stopping this problem, you could have framed this as them working towards cleaning up the Republic, and you could have made it from this sort of cheap, thoughtless, essentially jailbreak-type subplot into a real serious political drama with Finn and Rose trying to maneuver their way through the politics of the planet, the the underground, and trying to... Uh, the frustrations of of trying to stop internal corruption from an official point of view, and you could have had a great conversation about how difficult corruption is to deal with internally. You could have done that. It would have been 
such an in, uh, such a potentially interesting show if done correctly. Rose would have you could have taken Rose from an engineer, which isn't bad, right? But there's engineers all over the Star Wars universe. We see tons of engineers in the Star Wars universe, and Finn himself is not necessarily a huge slouch in the engineering department himself. So we really didn't need another engineer character, right? Um, it's not. I'm not saying that Finn as a character is officially an engineer, but he at least knows his way around technology well enough. Just as much as the next guy, anyways. But you could have made Rose, rather than an engineer, you could have made her into a up-and-coming political figure, and she could have been a really interesting examination of the New Republic's politics and how they work, and we would have been able to get a really interesting political character, which we don't have a whole lot of, because even when you look at the political characters that we had in the mainline movies originally, which actually, hell, take the political characters of most of the Star Wars universe before Disney took over, a lot of them were politicians secondarily. Let me take some of the bigger ones, right? Um, Amidala. She, yeah, was... Queen Amidala eventually became ambassador of Naboo, but she was also a action generating character, right? She was in action scenes. She was on Genosha in the fight, right? She was occasionally right there on the front lines. While the Clone Wars show did at least give some attention to politics in the Star Wars universe, and the it didn't really get into like the weeds of that, which I think would have been cool. Um Again, if done correctly. And we're talking, like, political maneuvers, assassinations, um, you know, and a political assassination attempt incidentally being, you know, one of the opening moments of episode two, which, you know, was a good direction. It was a fairly interesting um, opening to that. Get us kicked off into action. Get us, you know, right in line with... Uh, the the aged up characters and you could have done that with Rose you could have had Finn going to this planet to try to uh, resolve this issue at the behest of the New Republic after its victory over the First Order in Episode 9 could have had Finn go to this planet and you know try to figure out what he's going to do to resolve this this animal abuse problem on this planet he learns about Rose being in favor of banning this practice and, uh, maybe, you know, with him, with maybe some old First Order contacts or something, find out about an assassination plot and foil it, and then they work together to try to figure this out with Finn kind of doing the non-political side of things, gather information, um, uh, maybe stuff like that. Basically make Finn a really interesting sort of detective character, put him from the action role, the action pilot role, put him in a thinking role, really emphasize thought process here, advance his character, develop his character more outside of the context. Because as the, the films, as the, the Disney films went on, Finn became a less relevant character, unfortunately, which is a shame because I think he had a lot of potential as a character. Put Finn in a, like this detective role. You could even do a riff on, um, like, old film noirs if you really wanted to and you could really advance Finn as a character and have him he he already was sort of a, a moral character put him in some moral quandaries right you could have a using him as a vessel you could have some great moral conversations regarding all kinds of things right the the maybe there are people who are financially subsisting off of these these alien races, and there's a whole community around it, and now you've got to... Yes, it's, it's wrong and should be stopped, but how do we stop it doing the least harm to the people who are just trying to scrape by a living, you know? Obviously, it has to be stopped, but is there a right way to do that, Right? And have that whole conversation and have him come to grips with that, right? Because again, we've already... The, the episode 7, which out of the three Disney trilogy is my favorite. Again, it was, it, was, it was pretty good. 
he was, again, already established as a morally focused character. It's why he left the First Order. It didn't sit right with him what they were doing, right? And that's why he left. So pursue that with this... It would probably work best as a television series. Pursue that with him working with Rose, who, rather than being the engineer she was in the film, as a politician, and him doing, again, the detective work, and she does the political work, and they work together on that basis, right? He works as... as you can still refer to his combat training for the First Order. He can officially be like her bodyguard, but he also goes out and he finds out information around the, you know, the city in the planet that she wouldn't have access to as a politician, right? He would be able to, at the street level, find out some things she might want to know or need to know about things to better bring these subjects back into the political conversation, right? And I think that would have been a much better vessel for that plot line, and you could have done far more with it than just make it a, a basic jailbreak plot, right? As an example. So that's my first issue there. I think there was a lot of potential with that plot line that they threw away with making it a basic jailbreak. And again, it didn't really belong in that film. Not at that time. It didn't belong there. Right? There were other more important concerns going on in terms of the film's plot. The second thing I have an issue with is the fact that Poe wasn't a traitor. Right? We had the whole problem of him basically... Uh, not directly being said, but implying that he had an issue with what's-her-face, the the admiral woman, whose name I can never remember, I'm so sorry. Her name just escapes me all the time. And his antagonism towards her is implied to just be straight-up misogyny, which is a really boring motive, and it's it really feels like basic political messaging being shoehorned into the film, which doesn't sit well with any audience, right? If you're going to put in a political message like that, you've got to have some nuance here, right? But he really should have been a traitor. That would have been very interesting, because we could have, again, brought Finn into a moral quandary, which is a huge part of his character. Okay, his best friend is a traitor. He's working with the First Order, and now he has to come to grips with the fact that he has to stop or kill him. Maybe he discovers that Poe was a traitor before everyone else, and that's why Poe was so antagonistic towards the Admiral. Rather than, again, the very boring, basic motive of a shoehorned political message of basic misogyny, right? That's... I, I'm not saying that doesn't exist in real life, but we're also trying to tell a story here with movies. And that is for a a universe like Star Wars that is too basic of a plot idea to bother with. Make it more complicated, make it more interesting. Engage the audience with it. Could you put misogynist undertones among his reasoning? Maybe Finn discovers um, Poe is a traitor due to Poe just outright being against women in charge, right? Because there's not that many women in charge in the First Order either. There's um, the Stormtrooper woman there, but other than her, there's not really a whole lot of distinguishable women in the First Order, right? So maybe you can make it an actual um, problem. Maybe, maybe put undertones that the First Order is... Um, male focused and Poe spouting uh, maybe Poe drops a phrase common amongst first order troopers right uh, maybe it's it's a little derisive of women or maybe it's it's a specific dig at captain uh, what is her name captain F uh, it begins with ph F phaedra right and i have a hard time with the I just noticed I have a hard time with the names of the women because they're... I don't know. I I remember Rose's name. Because I, I just think about how much wasted potential they had with that character. But... Captain... I, I know the captain's name begins with PH. For the life of me. I just 
always think of her as the shiny stormtrooper, basically. Um, but yeah, he could have maybe referred to her accidentally or or said some kind of mildly misogynistic phrase that is common amongst First Order troopers and Finn recognizes it and looks into him and discovers he's a traitor. That would have been a much cooler plot point. You could have kept the undertone of misogyny in there very easily. And you could have used it against Poe and have Finn be the hero here once again, but then also have him have this whole moral quandary of what to do about his best friend really being a traitor, right? It, have that conversation. That is a much more interesting plot point than, oh, he just hates women. He's not really a traitor. It would have been more interesting if he was, right? Um, the third thing is the whole... Um, this this is a much shorter point, but the whole going into warp drive to crash the ship and explode a much larger ship, if that were to be canonical, and I hesitate to call it canonical even though it's in episode 7, if that were to be canonical, then what would be preventing the Trade Federation in the Clone Wars from doing the exact same thing, right? That should not have made it past theoretical ideas. It really should not have. Whoever came up with that idea clearly did not understand battle droids or droid ships in general, right? Because you could basically, again, the Trade Federation used basically just droids. Their whole army was droids. Their armada was droids. Their ships were droids. Going self-destructive hyperspeed crash, to put it politely, uh, their actual term I can't use here, but doing that would have been a lot more logical for the Trade Federation to use during the Clone Wars. And to make that canonical after the fact is not a hero moment. It is not the Admiral being a genius. That is... Bad writing. That is also a cheap way out. I would have far preferred her to find some way of outmaneuvering or outsmarting the opponent rather than just... And they only wrote that so she would have a noble sacrifice for whatever reason. I, I think that was also a mistake. I think her character could have been more interesting than what they gave her. Um, you could have had a huge, a huge, really interesting and more impactful plot line if she had say I'm gonna die studied under Admiral Akbar, the legendary Admiral right have have Admiral Akbar have died of old age between the sixth and seventh episodes right he just peacefully dies in retirement and have her be his best student and have her have this whole arc where she's she's trying to live up to his legacy and she does a fantastic job. She outmaneuvers the enemy and, and pulls a move of actual genius strategy. And, you know, for the rest of whatever her um, plot line is in Star Wars, among her other struggles, she can always uh, feel like she's not living up to the example of Admiral Akbar. And, well, you could put a a glass ceiling spin on this. I think it would work better as more... Uh, someone having this huge responsibility and huge expectation placed upon them and how they deal with that, especially in her case where she's in charge of a huge number of lives, right? I think that would have been a more interesting way to take the character, right? And um, that would have been a far more... I think, interesting and, and progressive examination of that character. Uh, last, there's the Mon Mothma thing, but I, I'm pretty sure that's just because they didn't want to kill off the character. Um, not Mon Mothma. Where did that name come from? Um, Leia. That's the one. Princess Leia. The whole Leia floating in space thing was, was weird, but I think that it was just... Uh, the writers writing themselves into a corner and, and that was their only solution. Um, I don't know how they wrote themselves into that corner. They could have just not had her 
be near the part of the ship that exploded, that would have been, you know, easier. Why they decided that that was the solution, I don't know. Uh, I'm not criticizing the scene for her floating through space back to the ship. That's obviously silly, but uh, my complaint really is, is that it didn't need to happen in the first place. It, it, it just didn't. They didn't need to be there at all. We, we didn't need to establish that Princess Leia can use the Force. We already established that in even works that Disney kept canonical. All right. We didn't need this. It was a totally unnecessary scene. It was a waste of, what, five minutes? It, it was absolute nonsense. All right. That, that didn't need to be there at all. Um, so we've got that, right? I, I'm not really going to get into the the ninth episode because quite frankly if the changes if if they'd done anything like what I was talking about here then a lot of nine wouldn't have happened right it would have it would have gone down far better uh, I didn't even talk about Luke Skywalker which is a whole can of worms that while I'm somewhat familiar with the Star Wars franchise, I, I'm not familiar enough with the backstory of Luke Skywalker. Other people have talked about that far better than I have. I'm not going to touch that, other than knowing that it was very incongruous with how the character had been portrayed literally everywhere else. Other than that acknowledgement of that being a problem, I... So, five things actually wrong with the... Uh, pardon me. Five things wrong with Episode 7. But... Yeah, that Luke Skywalker's portrayal was not great. Um, what could you do about it? I don't know. That's a really good question, because they're doing him fairly well as a character in The Mandalorian. I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, personally. I think that's good, overall. Do I have minor quibbles? Sure. But I like the parallels to his time on Dagobah with Yoda. The planet's name is Dagobah. I think it's Dagobah. Right? I, I think that is a good overall uh, angle. Right? I, I liked that generally speaking. Where am I going? Okay. I can't I can't click on these people. There we go. All right. Come on. But that's That is what I would specifically do there, right? With some of those points. Um, why they didn't? My guess is to some extent they wanted to shoehorn positive political messaging, which I don't baseline have a problem with if it's done right. It was just really shoehorned, and it was really obviously shoehorned is being, you know, the main problem here. But... I'm deviating from the point here. I really got off on a Star Wars tangent there. I apologize, but at the end of the day, Grim Dawn and the world that Iron Crate has created here has not quite as comprehensive levels of potential interest, but it has a lot. There's a lot to work with here in terms of franchisability here. As long as, again, they don't goof it egregiously. Right now, some people would say, well, uh, Witcher, right? Which is an interesting point, because some people, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to say some interesting things here regarding the Witcher series. First off, the games aren't one-to-one -one accurate with the book. That's fine. I was not expecting the show to be one-to-one -one accurate to the book or the games. I don't mind the three existing in sort of retellings, because the way I've always seen the series is the book is one person's version of the story, the 
game is another person's version of the story and the show is a third person's version of the story. And I think that's... I'm going to wait here and heal up a little bit here. Um, and I think that's... Uh, Holdo. Holdo is the, the Admiral's name. That's that's what I was forgetting. I still can't remember the Stormtrooper's name, but Holdo is is the Admiral's name. But anyways, back to the point now that I remember her name and I'm proud of myself. Um, you've really got... Uh, so I have that basis, right? And then we have the Witcher blood... Blood something, which a lot of people complain about. My main issue with that is really specifically the dialogue, right? Now, I don't mind them taking some creative license with the, the baseline plot here. Again, I don't mind that. The way that I've always perceived the Witcher series, both from the book, show, and game perspective, is that this is, these are basically different people telling the same story, so they add different details and they take away other details. Different retellings of that story have never bothered me, because that's kind of how it happens in real life, right? It does not cause an issue for me personally. But... With the Witcher blood whatever, I for the life of me, I cannot remember the full title of that show. Um, it's it's the language. They did such a great job with the dialogue of the first three seasons. And the characters feel consistent across the media, which is the only real thing that they needed to get right was not the characters' backstories. Adding or subtracting to that isn't a huge deal, but the feel, the overall attitude and outlook of the characters needed to be consistent, and they did a good job with that. I think they went the wildest with Siri. Which I think was probably the most um I have mixed feelings about that. On the one hand, that is definitely where they went the farthest from other portrayals of Siri. I know it's it's a bit more accurate to the book, but I played the game first, so I know this is partially an ummy issue. And I think they did do a good job with it ultimately, with her characterization. But I have mixed feelings, and and I know it's partially a me problem. But the problem with the 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 new series coming out is is looks like it's going to be the dialogue. It's not accurate to what it should be, and I think that's going to break a lot of the believability of that. It's an easy fix; just rewrite the dialogue. It's not like they have to even change the plot points. There's no even need to change the plot or the direction of that. They just need to change the dialogue. Yeah, they'd have to reshoot some stuff, sure, but honestly, if they keep the dialogue the way it seems to be, they're gonna have a rough time selling that to an audience of genuine fans, right? But, uh, I'll grab this, uh, I'll complete this last quest and then I'm always gonna go with Black Legion. The, the Order of Death's Vigil. I'm like, the Black Legion is who I'm working with. Derp. The Order of Death's Vigil. But uh, yeah, with that being said, that's where I'm going to go on ahead and end off this episode after a really long ramble. I apologize. But uh, thank you all very much for joining me. <laughs> if you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me. And have a great 24 hours.